We've got Pele Zetterstrom. He's the technical director of uh, fire engineering from GHD, which was formerly known as, as Olsen's um, Fire Engineering and Risk. So Pele is an accredited fire safety engineer in Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland and a Lund, Lund, Lund Engineering alumni, where he obtained his Bachelor of Science in Fire Engineering in 2005, with a wealth of experience from both rescue services and consulting fire engineering. Pele's working history includes Europe, Middle East and Australia, where he's recently joined GHD as a technical director. So I'd like you to welcome Pele. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, yeah. My name is Pelle Zetterstrom, previously of Olsen Fire, now of GHD Fire. We were acquired a couple of weeks ago. Right. And uh, so, 45 man strong, 30 from New Zealand, 15 from Australia, now supporting GHD, which is one of the big drivers doing a little bit of everything. <clears throat> so, I'm going to talk a little bit about planning audits and a performance based environment. I'll try and not hash. Uh, uh, too much, see if we don't overlap too much, and there's also Dean in the room, I think, hopefully I won't steal too much of your fun. There you are. Alright. So. <clears throat> Good rule of thumb is when you're doing a presentation, tell your audience what you're going to talk about. So, I'm going to do a little bit of a synopsis, uh, introducing ACPs, how we got here. Uh, ACPs in design and auditing existing buildings with ACP and conclude with a little bit of lessons learned. <clears throat> Picture, absolute courtesy of BBA, meaning I stole it outright. <laughs> Moving on, brief history, we're now getting into the tell them part. So, Lacrosse 2014, Docklands, Melbourne, uh, I believe it was November, cold November night, maybe not that cold, but in November, Melbourne, up from the other side. Uh, and then 2015, uh, Dubai Torch, uh, another one of the big ones. 2017, Grenfell, uh, 70, 80 dead, still counting, uh, missing people, uh, very, very tragic event. Uh, there are people more qualified than I to talk about both lacrosse and Grenfell, but if you want to have a chat, I'll be outside. Uh, but that's not the topic of today. Now we're going to see if you've been awake. Has anyone seen this before? That's right. That's Dubai Torch again, two years later. Same type of fire. So what, uh, I'm going to go back a little bit. Uh, not really the beginning. I'm going to spare you uh, the building code of Hammurabi. I'm going to skip over the fire of Rome, the fire of London, uh, the fire of Chicago, and move straight into the 1980s, what I call the era of alchemy. We started to get really, really good at, through chemical process, coming up with these products, mainly petroleum derived, uh, that we're doing things that we really wanted them to do, primarily insulation. We wanted to find better ways to insulate our houses. So we started to come up with these foam boards, sandwich panels, uh, the polyurethane, polyisocyanurate, express polystyrene, express polystyrene, extruded polystyrene, and the child of the hour, polyethylene. So we started putting these things, and we started to develop these products because we wanted to put them up on our buildings. Now, something happened in 1988. Anyone? If I say Fox Plaza, it's a red herring and has absolutely no technical relevance. <laughs> but in 1988, it was the introduction of BRE 135 and test standard 17-6. So in the UK, it was uh, uh, the test standard of fire performance of external thermal insulation for uh, walls in multi-story buildings. And then in the US, we had uh, a test standard 17 Dash six, which was introduced in the Uniform Building Code. Uh, we know it today as NFA 285. So, uh, shows a uh, cousin of BS8414, which we've heard about previously today. So, and then what? We started in England, Manchester, uh, existing building, concrete walls. We started to 
put up uh, uh, limited combustibility, finish applying uh, for rain screen and insulation purposes. But, as we've also heard, it had a 90 millimeter cavity gap between the, the wall that we're putting up and the existing concrete wall. Now, a fire started down low, uh, it was in trash, uh, and the fire spread from this cavity gap, uh, all four stories, extremely fast fire, and then also gone of court and four years later in Scotland. Unfortunately, it was a similar event, existing building, concrete structure, we put limited combustibility, uh, insulation up on the wall. We had another fast fire and one dead. <coughs> now what came out of this? Uh, building code reforms came out of both of these. For the UK one, there was an uh, introduction in the English building codes for the provision or the requirement of a cavity gap. And in the Scottish one, they introduced the equivalent that we have in the BCA, which is the requirement for uh, whatever part you put up on the building is not permitted to cause undue fire spread in the facade. And then in 2002, we saw the dawn of BS8414. And bringing it around back to us, that's essentially what we adopted in 2016 as AS5 level one. So now, we're back here in Australia and the Tasman. So what's happening with the ACP or the MCM, um, metal composite materials that we're putting up on our buildings? We have uh, very little news coming out of Darwin on Northern Territory. I've really, really tried, but I'm not finding much. But we have here in New South Wales, uh, I guess essentially we have task forces in each and every state and territory gearing up and doing their own thing and coming up with ways of how we're going to address this. But essentially, I think everyone knows and everyone has identified that we have an issue and that we need to address it, we need to look into it. We're going about it slightly different ways, but everyone wants to come to terms with it. So I think it's fair to mention the code marks, which have in Tasmania, they've been withdrawn, uh, a handful of them, a large handful of them have recently been withdrawn. And also a, in Victoria, you're no longer, for a new building permit, you're no longer permitted to rely on code marks for panels that have polyethylene content, content of 30 percent or more. Unless you want to go down uh, route with the building appeals board, which you can. So you can still do this, but it's more cumbersome, and to date, to my knowledge, I haven't heard of anyone trying to do this. Uh, Tasmania was a little bit more lucky. Uh, Tasmania is a lucky state. They, uh, they came up with a short handful that have identified we have ACP on our buildings, and then they only kind of narrowed it down to actually only have the one that's really troublesome, and it was a hospital, and they said, you know, it's just the one, let's just do it. So the government sort of preempted what was going on and did it themselves. Uh, <clears throat> so moving on. So what's, what's governing ACPs in design? So there was a little bit of a shift between pre-2016 Amendment 1 and uh, uh, well, what went before. But essentially between 1996 to 2006, there was very little change in requirements for type A, type B, uh, your larger buildings, fire, uh, fire aid construction. So, as we all know, BCA is a performance based code. The 1996 nationally adopted BCA is a performance based code. Compliance with the BCA is achieved through compliance with the performance requirements. Compliance with the performance requirements can be achieved either through deemed to satisfy or the performance-based design. There's no hierarchy of the two. DTS is not higher or lower than performance-based design. They sit together side by side. So in order to emphasize this in the 2016 design, they came up with an entirely new picture, changing everything. Code is essentially the same. That was a bit of a joke. You may laugh. So governing these areas is the performance requirements. Now, the model code, this is a Regis Digest. Uh, Please find your local certifier to give you the full rundown. 
so sitting below the performance requirements is the specification C1.1 table 3. We're talking now about type A construction and type A construction only because those are essentially the buildings that are at high risk. We're not looking in, I have not been looking into a lot of buildings of the smaller variety and I think uh, most of the task forces as well have excluded these from their initial run of the buildings that we're looking into. Uh, so, specification C1.1 says your external wall must be non-combustible unless it's a laminate, and if your laminate cannot be have more blue than yay, and its surface requirements must also be not too bad. And then it was the sort of catch-all requirement of attachment. You can use the paneling as an attachment subject to uh, also, again, not having too bad surface requirements. and it doesn't cause under fire spread, and if you don't put it too close to an exit, so that in the event of a fire, it makes the exit unusable. Now, these were performance-based deemed to satisfy clauses put into a deemed to satisfy building code, and they've been in there for quite a while. They, these cost a lot of a lot of people were scratching their heads exactly exactly as to what as to what this meant, but they were still in there. So. In the wake of everything else that has happened across the globe, uh, and especially around for that's when everything, the snowball really turned into to a levy. Uh, the amendment that came out in March 2018, 2016 Amendment 1, as uh, Mr. Brooks talked about, we saw the performance requirements hadn't changed, but the need to satisfy requirements had. So what was the laminates clause is still the laminates clause, but it's now explicit in that it's saying if you go for a laminate, the laminate inclusive of its core must be non-combustible. And if attachment, that component itself is now removed. So you can't use the attachment. They've made a clarification in the building code saying these are ancillary elements as in caulking or, or Sealant, but not panel. So, Fire Code Reform Center in the year 2000, 2000 said that these performance based clauses in the Deemed to Satisfy Code are inappropriate and they should be replaced. This was an Australian initiative to look over what's, what's out there. They, they made a number of studies, one of these. Uh, recommended changes to the building code in 2000. Anyway, <clears throat> so also, naturally, in the 2016 Amendment 1, uh, it's the introduction of verification method CV3. So it's a it deemed to satisfy approach as in tick the box exercises, including a test to AS5013, uh, and also like the introduction of sprinklers and cavity barriers, which enables you to find the new means to test your panel system or have your panel system tested or introduced to your building under a deemed to satisfy path. So when we're asked to audit a building, how do we go about this? Typically, it's along the line of, did the building comply with the, with the BC, governing BCA at the time? Now, there's a question here, which is, uh, if, Meeting BCA, is it also safe? That's a question for, for another time and another room. Uh, I welcome the discussion if you ask industry giants like Jonathan Barnett or, or Blair Stratton, Peter Johnson. They have all uh, opinions on this and they can give you examples on where and why being deemed to satisfy is not necessarily safe. But in terms of these planning audits, I think the benchmark that we must, must, must set now, the starting point is, did it comply with the VCA? And if so, if it didn't comply, then does it pose a risk? If it poses a risk, what do we need to do about it? So, if it did comply with the governing VCA at the time, it's unreasonable uh, in, in most of these larger stakeholder uh, discussions to go back and make amendments. Retroactively. Retroactively. So when we're engaged, this is a list of things that we ask for. We ask for pretty much everything that we can come across that 
highlights or documents what do we have on the building uh, from drawing uh, drawings details specifications quotes delivery dockets photographs from the time of construction anything and everything that tells us this is what we have on the building please give it to us so we can then start checking it is extremely rare that we get even half of this most of the time we have more, more often than not, you end up with very little that actually says what you wanted to say and a lot of things that are, is just wasting your time that have absolutely no relevance to the actual facade itself. So a case study, how these audits can go. Uh, first one says, all right, we have a Trudeau panel, a Trudeau FR panel on our building. And I say this because I'm not going to vouch for or talk, uh, give you the pros and cons of any particular type of pan panel or supplier. That's not my role. Uh, there are others who do that. So Trudeau, um, so let's just Trudeau be a, you know, uh, um, a name for someone who's relatively well known in the industry, it's a, one of the good names, has a reasonable level of documentation, most people respect it, that sort of thing. So, run one says, we have Trudeau Park on our building. Okay, fair enough. Uh, invoices, money transfer dockets, uh, uh, exterior finishes, everything is pointing towards the fact that we have Trudeau panel on the buildings. We didn't have any photos from the time of construction. Uh, and there was a little bit of weak link from what's invoiced to what actually got up on the building, but you know, this is what we had, and then we started digging. Uh, we had two damaged panels, so okay, let's do a sample of these and find out what we have. And when we pick a sample, we send them off to uh, one of the testing laboratories, and they do a Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, and also a energy, uh, I forget the name, uh, but it's an e EDS, SDM transfer analysis to find out what's the core composition and it came back these two panels one of them came back as a micro panel not a Trudeau and the other one came back as a true blue trunk panel it's the worst type of panel that you want 98% trunk <laughs> all right so now I went back to the builder saying look you said Trudeau panel but when we tested this it came back mantle panel and it came back trunk panel it's not exactly the same thing. To which they responded, oh, you mean the facade facade? <laughs> yes, yes, the facade. Because apparently there were two types of mountings. It was the window mounting, and then there was the facade mounting. Still panels. Uh, but anyway, after this confusion, how this was confusing, I don't know. But after this confusion was uh, uh, sorted out, <clears throat> we started getting all kinds of documentation. So and now, with a more complete set of documentation, inclusive of photos, we had uh, Trudeau panels and Merkel panels, and also the one road panel. Uh, still Trump, still sitting there, but it's pretty certain it was just a uh, replacement for damage. That, uh, you still don't want it. So, case study two, uh, it was supposed to be Merkel panels on the building. Uh, <coughs> we know this Merkel panels and we know this Macron panels, both of an FR variety. FR, by the way, does not mean fire resistant. It means that there's a level of fire retardant uh, additives to it. There's no such thing as a fire rated panel unless you start talking about wall systems uh, that have gone to a completely different test standard, AS 1530 Part 4. FR does not mean fire rated. It means fire resistive to an unknown degree. <clears throat> so we had two FR panels. Uh, there was a fire engineering report prepared by one of the uh, well-respected fire engineering consultancies saying that, okay, we know we have these panels, we're putting them on the building, but we still think it's okay because uh, reasons X, Y, Z. And it was used both, both as part of wall, as an attachment, and about X. And, that, like, and this is fine. If you acknowledge what you have on the building, if 
you know what you're putting up, where and why, and how you're mitigating the risks, or how you're controlling the risks, that's fine. Uh, so we do our first round of digging, and we encounter correspondence showing that there's a mix of glue fixing and mechanical fixing. Now, if you're putting these up and you're going the code mark variety uh, to your uh, level of compliance, then most of these, if not all, require that you mechanically fix these panels to the building. So that's deviation one, which then should be, a, if you, that's the route you're going down, then it should be addressed in your performance-based solution. And we're also finding combustible insulation behind the panels. We'll get into that later, but the requirement is for the entire wall system to be non-combustible, not just the panels. And also, up comes the builder saying, look, I know that you asked for my chrome panels, but I slipped in some PE panels, uh, some Le Pen panels there as well. Right, okay, <coughs> not my chrome. Le Pen, same color scheme. <laughs> so they were both French, same color scheme. You can't see the difference when they're up on the wall. Um, we just know that one of them is okay, one of them is what we intended, and the other one is something that we really don't want. And it's just somewhere on this building having the same color scheme. Okay. So, it started out good. The design team was aware that these, these things are something that we should be treating with caution. We can't just put them up willy-nilly. We have to do this by the book. And it started, the intention was there. But it was missing some of the documentation. And then, you know, by all means, insert Shergold Weir uh, report recommendation here. Uh, Shergold Weir, uh, if you're not familiar with the document, go out, hunt it down. It's freely available on the web. It's a very interesting read. So, all the team needs will needs, going back a little bit, past the case studies. Uh, the two biggest ones are, are yeah, by virtue of Australia, it's Victoria, it's New South Wales. Slightly different ways of going about it. Personally, I think the New South Wales is slightly more nuanced, it's slightly more reasonable, whereas the Victoria one is a little bit more aggressive. Uh, in its tone, perhaps. He goes out and say, uh, we think your building is unsafe. You have 30 days, give or take, to show us as to why you think the building uh, should not, why the panel should not come down, why the building uh, doesn't have to be evacuated, why it's safe to still be in the building. Uh, in New South Wales, it's a little bit more, we want you to assess the building. Uh, you have eight weeks to engage a professional, or you have four weeks to engage a professional. So after that, you have eight weeks to come back and tell us whether or not you think the building is okay. Tell us what you found. Uh, in my experience, in no event, if you're trying to do a full and thorough audit, do you actually meet any of these deadlines, which is why the New South Wales is a more reasonable stance. Uh, there hasn't been a single one, in my experience, that actually met the 30 days of the Victoria. But they've gone out and they've done other things. They're, they're, as soon as the building is identified, they have a little bit of a tribunal that happens, and they send out a team that go out and they fix the fire doors, they put smoke seals up to make sure that the fire safety systems in a building are uh, looked after. And that's possibly something that could be, should be addressed here in New South Wales as well, because there are many tiers to the level of fire safety inside a building. So what is risk? So we've done the did the building comply with the, with the building code? If it didn't, uh, it doesn't pose a risk. If it poses a risk, what should be done about it to mitigate said risk? So, so what is risk? We talk about risk is low, the, but the risk is low that something like this would happen. Well, is it really? Are we talking about the same thing? Because to me and most of the other professionals, risk is some sort of product of consequence and probability. Risk is the resultant uh, of these two. So when we say risk is low, what we really mean is that probability is low. Uh, a climbing fire is a consequence thing, it's a safe act. So I'm gonna play a little video from a fire in Dubai uh, in May this year, in Zen Tower. So you see the fire, uh, 
Uh, on this side of the corner, you see how it's, it's sped up like a chimney on the other side of the corner. And there's fire on three facades at once. It's spread up, it's spread down, it's spread through the pounding. Uh, and it's still going. It was incredibly fast. You can see it also dripping. Uh, you can see these paneling, these panels, how they, they burn and they drip because the fires they spread up and they spread down. Incredibly fast compared to a conventional fire. Uh, okay. So in the UK, a lot of information came out of the um, uh, the studies done after the Grandfather Tower. BRE did a lot of testing, large scale yeah. testing, not full scale, large scale. Testing. And what came out is that they call their categories one, two, three, where uh, one is the good panel, three is the bad panel. Here in Australia, we did it the other way around. We said A is the bad panel and D is the good panel. So we have a four panel scale, they have a three panel scale going the other way. But what they found was if you, the, the bad panels will perform badly no matter what you do. The good ones will re perform reasonably well no matter what you put down. But the ones in between, the FR panels, the typically called FR panels, they will, if you do it right, perform well. If you do it wrong, if you put not, if you put combustible insulation behind it, if you don't put in your county barriers, if you put other bad things behind it, they will, they too will perform badly. So, fire risk exposed by the cladding is, is an incomplete question. We need to look at the entire wall system as a whole. You can't just look at the cladding alone. So. After you've done all this, after you've established your, your panel type, and you've done your sent off your materials for, for, for composition testing, you've looked at the wall behaviors, uh, you've assessed, is it a code mark, is it deemed to satisfy, is it a performance-based solution? I remember one day I came home, I was feeling really good, <coughs> I told my wife, I feel like a combination of Einstein and, and, and Sherlock Holmes, because I've really done my sleuthing, I've done really well. And, she enforced me, and I'm still just a bleak copy of Manly coming back. She's been there before, he's done it all. And he's taller and he's more blue eyed than you. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> so, back to auditing these buildings. What's going back to basics is, is what you really must have to do. You have to go back and check the performance requirements. And there's a picture of Wu Shen, uh, Korea in 2010. The, the building was horseshoe shaped. So, what happened then is that that channel in, in between the U uh, created a chimney and the fire spread fantastically rapidly. It started to get heat uh, uh, reflecting back and forth in between the buildings. So the fire spread ex extremely fast. So you need to look at, is there anything particular to this building? Uh, every building is different. Is there anything particular to this building, which means that I can or cannot use this, this material in this manner? So what are the lessons learned? DTS is an excellent starting point, but it's not to be all and all. Uh, don't make assumptions. You know, or make as few as you necessarily need to in order to progress. But try and keep your assumptions to a minimum, because we all know what assumptions mean. Don't judge a book by its cover. Don't trust everything you see or hear. Dare to sleep a little bit. And manage expectations, manage time. You know, be, be, be up front, because we're all new to this. Every building owner is scared, he may or may not have gone through the motions before. We're all new, we're all trying to upskill, we're all trying to learn, and body corporates just manage expectations for what can and can't be done within the time frame. So putting the puzzle together, you know, your job is to depict things fair and square. What's the story you want to tell? Do you have special lenses through which you see things? Or are you being objective? Are you being objective? Uh, this is my son, three years old. He's trying to put a puzzle together. And he, he has one of the pieces. He's almost done. He has one of the pieces. And he really, really wants it to go in this particular spot. But it doesn't fit there. You know? There are many, many ways of putting one of these artists together. But it may not necessarily be the way that you want it to. Try and be as objective as you can. You see yourself told. That was very good. Any questions? What's coming from the previous lecture and yours? I know already can be pre and post, but what I'm having trouble with is why is not the panel manufacturer Material behind it, all one. 
I, I, sorry, what's the, what's the question in there? The, it's the question being you've got ACP panels. Mm. Now, that's the claim. Yeah. But what's causing some of these catastrophic fires, apart from them being flammable, is the chimney effect because of the lack of cabin protection or whatever material is behind that. Mm. So in theory, you've got three different contractors. You don't have one. Yes. Yeah, no, more, more, than, more often than not, you have five, seven contractors. You know? some, some have done the, you know, some have done the steel work, some have done the glazing, some have done the paneling, uh, some have done the caulking, uh, and it may have been done at the time. Uh, some may, be, may or may not have done the canopy protection or the intermescent or whatever it may be. Uh, more often than not, it's the lack in picture is the lack of adhesives cohesiveness and general oversight and that's uh, something that Sherville Weir talks a lot about you know getting uh, getting that overall responsibility who's looking after this you know, it needs to be not I have my blinkers on I'm looking after this it needs to be a chain of responsibilities interlocking so that all the areas are covered not not circles inside a square because then the corners aren't covered so who is the Dean, uh, you want to take this one? Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll jump up next and give the certifiers view of who's responsible. <laughs> yeah, uh, look, and I think that's uh, first and foremost, first in the firing line is the builder. Uh, but then the builder in turn may have you know, a trickle down effect of contract and uh, responsibilities and subcontractors. And then it comes down to what the contract said and what the specification said. And it, it can get really hairy, and uh, uh, I think a lot of courts, a lot of courts today, and even more tomorrow, will try and answer just that question. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> the certification, isn't it uh, compulsory for the certifier to actually look at the, the wall system while it's being constructed before you can certify the building with the end of the building to know exactly how the thing went together, uh, and then the responsibility would then sit with the certifier. I'm going to say not necessarily, but that too, I'm going to pass <coughs> the question itself on to Dean, who, as a certifier, will give his view uh, up next. But uh, it's not necessarily, is my response. You said that um, the entity said in 2000 that the code were inappropriate some mm -hmm. 18 years ago. By a code reform center, yes. Why the hell would we as consultants get involved in this? Um, <coughs> do you want me to elaborate on? Why would we as consultants even want to get involved in not assessing, but even looking at this sort of product when 20 years ago it was failed? Uh, what Fire Code Reform Center, they did not say 20 years ago, uh, ACP panel is bad. You can't use it on a building. What they said was the way the code is written, it opens for a mis you know, misuse or misinterpretation. So, but. It, it was about that time that we started to uh, realize that, especially the PE panels, weren't perhaps the right thing. Some, some of the suppliers started withdrawing their full PE uh, flavor, you know, and selling only the FR flavor at about that time. So. Um, this is obviously a worldwide problem. It's happening in different countries, and you're saying that So the, the ISO standards uh, are trying to be global. Uh, the European standards, of course, cover Europe. Uh, and then it's a matter of, you know, you can't really, uh, unless you change. You have to change it from the top up, because the building codes and the associated standards, they're, they're intended to work as a suite of codes. You know, uh, together, they look at different links of the chain. So if you start saying, okay, for, for these matters, we're going to use this code, then you have to start adapting all the links that connect to that other link. So they, they, all the model codes and associated standards work as a unit. So if you start changing the one, um, maybe we're there one day. Yeah. 
one world, one dream, John and everyone singing happily. Uh, <laughs> sounds fantastic. Uh, sun me up, fortunately, not there yet. Uh, Mel, that could have been the Trump panel. Thanks, Mel. Thank you very much. Um, we're obviously um, we're assessing cladding, but it looks like now we're assessing wall systems.